Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. Uh, I'm trying so hard not to make a heavy S sound. I realize, realizing that I do it a lot. I'm not sure if I'm overcompensating my hearing frequency specialization or focus and because every S sounds so intense as I'm saying it, but besides the point, welcome back. Uh, maybe it's your first time. If it is, welcome for the first time. Appreciate you coming around. Hopefully you are here because uh, you're curious about psychedelic experiences, psychedelic culture. Uh, hopefully you are here because you're curious about uh, cool conversations that provide insightful um, and positive, generative um, contribution to your life. I, I don't pre-plan what I'm going to say, guys. I just kind of I just kind of go for it. Um, but yeah, today's episode is with Deb Dana. Uh, I recently took a workshop with her, the clinical applications of the polyvagal theory back in Toronto, uh, oof, maybe five months ago, six months ago, maybe longer actually. Uh, and it was really informative. Um, I was already pretty familiar with the polyvagal theory and I have since become even more familiar. Uh, and I feel excited about this interview. I feel excited to share it with you. Uh, even though you don't know maybe anything about the polyvagal theory, or you've just been hearing it for the first time and you have no idea why it might be related to psychedelics, don't worry, all of that will become clear as the interview unfolds. So, Deb Dana, LCSW, is a clinician and consultant specializing in working with complex trauma and is the coordinator of the Kinsey Institute Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. She developed the Rhythm of Regulation clinical training series and lectures internationally on ways in which polyvagal theory informs work with trauma survivors. I'm both happy and excited to have her on the show. We had a great conversation, or at least I felt really good about the conversation uh, during and afterwards. I still feel quite good. I think you will enjoy this episode. Um, before we get into it, these people, the ones that are listed on your screen, uh, the ones that are listed by name in the show notes of this episode, be it on YouTube or elsewhere, uh, they are the people who are giving significantly, uh, they are patrons who are giving quite significantly to the Adventures Through the Mind podcast project, and of course the larger body of my work as a creative entrepreneur and intellectual. So huge thanks to them and to all of my patrons. Thank you very much for helping sustain the show. And uh, if you are interested in becoming a patron, if you're not already, please head to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso to find out more uh, about what kind of perks you can get, uh, how you get your name listed on the screen for the next episode, so on and so forth. Other ways you could support include just throwing money in my direction, PayPal, for example. You could also get some cool swag off the At Mind store, uh, like the shirt that I'm wearing right now if you're on YouTube. You can see that I'm wearing it. Love you to buy one of those. Um, and blotter art, several other interesting creative things that you could buy on the store. Or you could just subscribe. If you're on YouTube, smash like and subscribe. You probably know that reference. Uh, and yeah, those are great ways to support. JamesWGesso.com forward slash support uh, has all those options listed there. Thank you very much for making the time and investing yourself into supporting the podcast. Thank you. A couple points. Uh, you know, at some point in the interview, I say something about a calamity and whether or not the listeners are going to be included as to what that calamity was before the interview started. I don't actually remember what it is. So I leave it up to you to theorize. You can hit me up on Twitter and tell me what you think uh, was, the, was the calamity that might have happened beforehand. I'm curious to see what you think. The other one the other point is that at the end, I'm going to explain in more detail why it is that I feel the polyvagal theory is one of the most important things that I've learned about in my life so far. But that's enough of that. Here is my interview with Deb Dana on Adventures Through the Mind. We're jumping straight in right now. I actually love bringing polyvagal theory to everyday people because, as you said, the autonomic nervous system is this common denominator um, in the human um, for humans, for all humans. And so we're all working with the same basic biology and it's good to be able to have a shared language around that. So thanks for the feedback. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think for, you know, for listeners who aren't familiar or even if they are, I think we'd say the most basic question that's coming up 
might be what is the polyvagal theory? And I also understand that that question, I think you even mentioned it, um, you had mentioned, no, was it you? Or maybe it was a Stephen Porges interview that I watched recently, where the question itself is just such a massive question. It's just like, uh, you know, where do we go? What do we do? So I thought I would offer you my understanding of the polyvagal theory, which I am very self-aware will be limited if entirely false, and have you sort of launch off of there confirming, denying, correcting, expanding, um, which is that the polyvagal theory is a theory that explains the underlying biology of the nervous system's variety of threat response mode uh, modes, fight, flight, and freeze, and each response's evolutionary um, and adaptive function, as well as how these biological um, activations influence our psychological state. Okay, so let's start there. So, um, it, yes, and um, polyvagal theory um, not only describes the um, adaptive survival responses of fight, flight, um, freeze, um, disconnect, collapse, but also that survival response of connection. Right. So that, too, is is a survival response. We want to remember that. So polyvagal theory describes um, the three states um, in the autonomic nervous system, the three parts of the autonomic nervous system that bring those um, responses and um, helps us map um, how they come, when they come, what brings them and um, how to work with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pri the priority of uh, social engagement and the the discussion of social engagement as a survival mechanism and not necessarily as like the consequence of when there's no survival needed um, was a was a pretty cool a pretty cool unlock I guess a, a lesson for me in in uh, in learning with you although I would like to get into you know right away as that was a pretty you know your great generalization of what the polyvagal theory is I think the real richness comes out when we start to explore the various concepts and as sort of the larger image begins to take shape as a, as a consequence of exploring the parts and how they relate to each other and um, in your in your training you talked about the three organizing principles of the polyvagal theory which were neuroception hierarchy and co-regulation so Let's start with neuroception, because that's a pretty new and interesting word. Sounds very cool, very trendy with the neuro and the whatnot. But why don't you start out, tell us, you know, what is neuroception? So that very trendy word was coined by my um, dear friend and the developer of polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges, um, because the nervous system operates below the level of conscious awareness. It's a subcortical system. And so he was looking for a word that could describe how the nervous system takes in information. And perception um, didn't fit because perception involves our um, thinking parts of our brain. So he had to come up with a, a new word. and He coined the word neuroception. He would love to know that that's a trendy word. So there you go. So neuroception is the way our nervous system um, is always looking in the way that I call inside, outside, and between for cues of safety and danger. So the inside is it's listening inside our bodies, it's listening in our organs to our viscera to feel what's going on. It's listening outside in the environment in which we're in. And then it's listening between our nervous systems. So between my nervous system and another nervous system. And it's doing this moment to moment in the background all the time. Um, and so we don't um, experience the direct consequence of neuroception, we, we experience what neuroception then brings. Mm -hmm. So we experience the physiological response to neuroception. And the interesting thing is we often are unaware of what triggered that response. So part of the work with polyvagal theory is to bring perception to the experience of neuroception so that we can then figure out, how did I just end up where I am? Why did my nervous system bring me this response? Mm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting. I think something that you had said was something along the lines of um, the nervous system listens underneath the world. Yeah, yeah. It's always listening in the background, always. So in this moment in time, your nervous system and mine are doing that neuroceptive dance, right? And we are separated by um, thousands of miles and we're trying to come into connection with this 
you know, technology that every now and then falls out of sync and our nervous systems are feeling cues of danger and, you know, neuroception is just flooding us with all sorts of experiences. So I'm looking at your face and my nervous system getting cues of safety from Mm -hmm. seeing your face, right? Mm -hmm. Your voice. And yeah, but yes, in the background, it's our, I call it our internal surveillance system. And so it's always working to serve our survival in the background. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, maybe I might be I might be jumping the gun here, but I think uh, I think we'll go for it. Which is this? You know, you you'd mentioned that we're you know we're mostly looking at each other in the face. Just you know where you're looking at the screen isn't directly into the camera, so there's some gap in eye contact and stuff. But for the most part, we've got this this face to face interaction here, and you know the nervous system is reading um, cues of safety. Can you talk a little bit about where our face to face human interaction? Um, where that falls inside of uh, what the value of it is insofar as safety and danger, because especially it's pretty common, you know, increasingly common now people understand negativity bias, you know, you're more likely to have a negative interpretation of things, even if it's, you know, if it's neutral, if it's net, it's negative, it's negative, it's really negative. And uh, a lot of our communication these days, I know for myself, exists in a social media sphere where everything is text-based and, you know, negativity bias comes in there and then there's all sorts of shouting and fighting and there's no capacity to, you know, reattune to some sort of reciprocity. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about the, the importance of face-to-face uh, human interactions insofar as the uh, regulation and health of the nervous system? Sure. So I love what you said about text-based communication. It's really hard to, to, to feel into the cues from, from a text. And we often um, misread those and you know, feel a cue of danger. And then um, that cue of danger gets fed up to our brain and our brain makes a story. And the stories can take off pretty quickly, can't they, if we don't have any context to, to hold them in. So this um, face-to-face interaction and voice um, and um, this head movement that that we're doing. These are all parts of what was called the social engagement system. So it's um, made up of five cranial nerves. So it's cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus, um, which is the major part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So that nerve then connects in your brainstem with nerves that control um, your eye gaze, your, your head turn and tilt, the, the muscles in your ears, um, the, the, your larynx, pharynx, so the way that you speak. So all of this combines to create what um, we call the social engagement system. And so right now, even though I probably should look in the camera rather than the screen, my eyes are looking at your eyes, looking here. Right around the eyes is called the obicularis oculi. And um, if, if, if you smile for a minute and, and wrinkle your eyes, you know, and I, I have these lovely crow's feet, you have crow's feet, those crow's feet tell a story. They tell an autonomic story to another nervous system. So, you know, my eyes are looking around your eyes to get cues of safety or see cues of danger. So it's those signs of warning or signs of welcome that we look to another face to find our nervous system is looking there. And then... Um, the prosody, so so the the way we're speaking, the the rhythm, the music of our voice, is also um, an autonomic cue of either safety or danger. Um, you know, people who speak in a monotone voice. So, if I stop for a moment and just speak in a monotone voice, and you can notice what's happening in your nervous system, you'll feel a response. It's like, ooh, what just happened? You know, because your neuroception picks that up as a cue of danger. You know, so then we come back into into connection, our facial expression, our eyes, the tone of voice, and then this lovely movement of our head that, that we do. We just naturally do. If, if we look at each other and try to keep our heads straight, it's, it's very weird. Yes. And then if you look and you go, oh, you just naturally have a bit of a tilt to your head, which again is, is wired into our nervous system. It, it's a cue of safety to another nervous system. It, it's, a, it's a signal of welcome. So yeah, um, when, when we're missing all these cues, which we often miss in um, in text and email, you know, I suppose that's why we try to use emoji faces. I don't know to try and you know, here's what's going on, right? <laughs> you know, but it's certainly not the same as as um, you know this. You know, this this lovely face to face. I actually did a phone consultation 
um, earlier today, and it was very weird to not have face. You know, even to just have voice was better than email, but it was very odd to, to not have a face to, to connect to and to get more context about what's happening on the other end, or what the, what's happening with that nervous system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you know what the listeners don't know, or they might know, depending on how I, you know, what I say in the intro when I'm doing post production on this episode, uh, is that there was like a weird calamity that happened just before we started to speak. And I admit that I was starting to feel increasingly more anxious. I was feeling embarrassed about being unprepared and unprofessional, and and all this stuff. And it, and it carried over really into the up until the last like maybe three or four minutes as my nervous system calmed down, and I actually was like oh i'm thinking less about professionalism and i'm i'm more just landing with like the cues of safety in your face that as we're talking and that it's like oh she's at ease i can also be at ease and uh and this is something too that 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 you know it goes in it's in neuroception right that's not something that i'm sitting there going i wonder if that person is a safe person i'll watch their eyes it's like your nervous system just just does this automatically yes Yes, exactly. There's a lot of automatic experience happening with the autonomic nervous system. Absolutely. Thank goodness, because it would be exhausting to be thinking about it all the time, right? Right, right. Yeah. And I'm thinking about, yeah. uh, and of course, all, all of this, like like all uh, adult psychology, you know, eventually goes all the way back into into our early childhood and our relationship to our primary caregivers and our our mother, be that our biological mother or the mother, whoever that happened to be. Um, and then, of course, we could go even further back into intergenerational stuff and epigenetics, but we won't. Um, and I think about in, in childhood, it's like, a, it's like a funny theme, you know? It's like when your mom says your name, she can say your name in one way, and it's like, oh, that's very soothing. And just the ever so slightest tone change, and it's like the kid, like, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. Or the whole idea of like mom, mother's gaze, you know, can put your nervous system at ease, but can also immediately alert you to something is wrong and you need to stop whatever you're doing, right? Exactly, exactly. Yes, it's a, it's it's truly remarkable what we what we convey, what we communicate through those very subtle um, signals. Yeah, and you know, going back to to early childhood, I guess is a good time to say that the nervous system is a is an organ of relationship. So mm-hmm. it's it's shaped by our experience um, in the world, our experience with other people. So those early experiences um, really did shape our system in a certain way. And the, the lovely thing about knowing that is knowing that ongoing experiences can reshape our system. If, if, if we have a pattern that, that doesn't work for us anymore, ongoing experience can um, reshape the nervous system. So that's that's the hopefulness that that comes out of polyvagal theory that that knowing that. Mm-hmm. And that goes into I think that goes into into hierarchy, which is the three particular predictable pathways of response. Because you said you know when we're kids, like well, you said I said we sort of agreed early life really sets the stage for how the nervous system is shaped, um, and and how it is shaped sort of determines what it neurocepts as danger and safety and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, But then there is this predictable pathway of how it responds to safety and danger, um, which looks different in every person. But can you explain what those predictable pathways are and what this hierarchy is? Sure, sure. So yes, um, the nervous system was organized in, in three different states. And we go from the, the oldest state, um, which is the dorsal vagal system, part of the parasympathetic. And that dorsal vagal system is a system of immobilization. So um, when it's just doing its non-reactive role for us, it helps run our digestion. So it's an important part of the nervous system. But when it moves into an adaptive survival response, it takes us into collapse into disconnection, um, into a, a conservation mode where, where we sort of disappear, um, dissociation and some flavor of being foggy or fuzzy is that dorsal vagal survival response. And then the next system to come online in our evolutionary history is the sympathetic nervous system. And that's a system of mobilization. Um, people probably know that as, as the fight and flight system. That's where those intense mobilizing 
um, adaptive survival responses live. But when it's doing its non-reactive role, it's simply helping pump our blood and working with our with our breath and our blood pressure and all the good things that it needs to be doing, again, in the background. And then finally, the newest part of the nervous system is the ventral vagal system. It's also part of the parasympathetic. Um, but what it does is it brings us into um, this, the safety of social connection, where I can connect to myself, I can connect to you, I can navigate the world from that place of, of feeling safe. And it's that ventral vagal system that we need to have um, online, overseeing the fullness of our autonomic nervous system in order to stay in this place of safety and connection. So if we think about, that's the evolution of the nervous system. And then we can think about the dissolution that happens in our everyday life, which is opposite, you know, the, the, the opposite of evolution, how we go backwards. And that's the predictable pathways of the hierarchy. So we're in ventral vagal and you and I are doing well together and some challenge comes up and my nervous system uses more sympathetic mobilizing energy to try and meet that challenge. Right? And hopefully it will when we come back into connection. But if the challenge is so big that my ventral vagal can't work to meet the challenge, my sympathetic nervous system is going to come to the rescue, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be in fight or flight, right? And our interview will not go well from that place. Right, right. <laughs> so, right. And then if sympathetic um, meets the challenge, then I'll go back to ventral. But if it doesn't meet the challenge, my nervous system is then going to um, feel a neuroception of life threat and it's going to take me into dorsal vagal shutdown. And then I will um, disappear, whether you know it's a feeling of disappearing or an actual um, um, losing connection with you or, or collapse or um, dissociation. And that's predictable. Our nervous systems go through that pathway. And then in order to come back into ventral, I have to move out of dorsal. I have to have a little bit of mobilizing energy because in dorsal, my system has not enough energy to run, run it. So I have to bring some energy gently in, which then moves me through sympathetic back to ventral. So you know, in my work, I use a ladder. So ventral's at the top of the ladder, sympathetic in the middle, dorsal at the very bottom. And we're always, you know, climbing up and down that ladder. You know, it's, it's part of our daily experience, whether it's in an extreme response or whether it's in this, this flavor, this nuance of response where there's a, you know, a little sympathetic or there's a little fogginess. And, you know, but it's still it's this navigating through those three states that happens all the time for, for we humans. The, the goal is not to be in ventral vagal all the time. The goal is to be flexible in the ways we, we move in and out. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, definitely. There's a there's like a. It's not like we should always be in 100% like safety and clarity, which may be talking a bit later about um, about some of the problematic politics around safety would be would be a cool uh, thing to unpack. But it's like we, you know, a healthy nervous system is a nervous system that can appropriately respond to the needs, to its needs inside of, of an environment, inside of a social situation in a way that that enables basically its healthy functioning, which might include needing to run. and and. And what I'm hearing you describe, if if I'm if I'm getting it um, right, is that you know we've got these three pathways, and the first one is we try to talk it out. If something gets weird, we'll say like, okay, now things aren't aren't jive. We're not jiving anymore. But first, try to talk it out. And as we're starting to talk it out, the body's like, whoa, something's up. Okay, I just let's try to talk this out. You know, but you're still showing up ventral, even though there's an a uh, uh, sympathetic response coming online eventually talk it out doesn't work and it's either like full run or fisticuffs and if you can't run away and you can't fight the nervous system goes um oh it's it's way too dangerous this is a life threat just like you know pr protect the mind by making it go away dissociate go into shock or or you know like you know protect to ensure that none of the limbs get broken in resistance completely, you know, at a uh, cat cataplexy to the muscles. So that's, and that's like, now we're at like a um, lizard response, just like death feign, maybe even just like pass out. And, and this is like the predictable response. And to get back from dorsal, which is obviously a powerless place, um, we need to step into this fight or flight to mobilize back to 
ventral. Right. Does that is that? And we need to step. It's, that's beautifully done, and we need to step into the power of sympathetic, but not in an uncontrolled fight flight. It's when we step back into that mobilizing energy, we need to be in, in a controlled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I do understand, like, um, I'm thinking about uh, a couple people I've had in my life that I know who have had who have struggled with addiction. And they struggle with addiction because they're, they're deeply depressed, like they're broken, traumatized people. Um, and, you know, they, in particular, I'm thinking of a couple people I've known who have had uh, cocaine addiction in their life. And I see the cocaine as this means to give them power when they're feeling absolutely powerless. And then they come back and, and dorsal is such a frightening place that they're there um, and they can't get any help because all their relationships are damaged because of the behaviors. You know, they're in this place. They can't get out of there. They're in there for long enough that the only thing that they could think to do is to go back into mobilization through the use of, of this, you know, like strong stimulant, which then you know, eventually wears off because it's not this controlled return to safety and connection. It's just desperate attempt to get out of the dorsal because dorsal is such a distressing place. And then, so now we're, I guess now we're talking about addiction, but did you want to comment on that a little bit? That's a, that's a beautiful description and, and, um, you know, any kind of addiction or any kind of, you know, compulsive behavior that, that happens, it often happens to get us out of, out of dorsal. The, the nervous system is longing to be in ventral. Right. I think that's our inherently preferred state. And we keep trying to get there. Right. And so for, for your, you know, your, your friends who struggle with, with addiction, that, you know, get me out of this dorsal place that, you know, I have clients you who know, call it being in that dorsal dead place. It feels dead. It feels like we've stopped existing. And so we do something to feel again, and whether that's heroin or cutting or, you know, some behavior that, that makes us you know, feel alive again. Um, it's, it's, again, the nervous system attempting to come out of dorsal and, and reach ventral. The, the trouble being, you know, we, we get stuck in that um, ongoing um, behavior that, that doesn't get us to ventral. It, we then end up back in, in dorsal. And that's a loop that happens often. It's that dorsal, sympathetic dorsal loop that we see in, in um Many, many people we work with, many of our friends, but it's, it's not an uncommon loop for someone who has experienced a lot of trauma to be stuck in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it is suggested uh, in polyvagal theory that trauma, um, trauma is a, well, first, I, I want to just like interject that what I'm hearing you saying is something that I've, I've heard or partially saying is something I've heard described as that um, from Gabor Mate, that the addiction is not the problem. The addiction is a solution to a problem, which is pain. It's just a it's just a very poor solution that causes more pain in, in the long run. Um, and so, so through a polyvagal yeah. lens, you know, um, the addiction is the solution to a system that's stuck in dorsal, right? Yeah, and it's it doesn't it doesn't then last. It's not a solution that gets us to ventral, but in the moment, it's a solution that gets you out of the because dorsal is like the path of last resort, mm -hmm. right? When there's nothing else, we go to dorsal. And so, yeah, it, it is a, a, a solution to that problem. It's a good way to think about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking about dorsal, and now we're talking about trauma, uh, it's suggested in polyvagal theory that trauma is sort of an emerging consequence of, of getting stuck into dorsal. Um, and maybe you can expand on that. I'm thinking about... Um, uh, about some of the stuff I read from Stephen Porges, some of the things I heard you talking about in the workshop, and then thinking about uh, Bessel van der Kolk talking about effective mobilization and that people in what could be could be a quote traumatic experience, if they're able to have effective mobilization, um, then they don't land in trauma because they you know they've engaged their mobilized their nervous system to bring to bring safety. Can you talk a little bit about? The relationship between dorsal and trauma, right? So, so I like um, you know I like when Bessel talks about mobilization. Steve does as well. It's when we feel trapped, when we feel as if there is no escape, that our system will take us into that dorsal collapse, that place of, of not being here, of powerlessness, and and um, you know so, and that brings a, a traumatic um, aftermath, you know, because we we are. Um, we are powerless. We, we have gone to that death-banging place in order to survive. 
And I think, you know, we do find that people who in a trauma have a way to mobilize have far less consequences afterwards because they are actively engaging in um, um, their survival. And often after that, will be able to come back to ventral, right? Because on that hierarchy, you've got ventral, sympathetic, dorsal. So in sympathetic, where you're mobilized, you know, you're clo- you can go back to ventral. You can reach that place for going back to ventral. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's true. I think one of the other things we talk about trauma, um, Steve once said trauma is a, um, ongoing um, disruption of connectedness, mm-hmm. um, a chronic disruption of connectedness. And I like that sense because, you know, we're, we're longing for connection. And I think one of the things we also find about post-traumatic response is that if, um, you're met by another person, if you're met by a ventral vagal regulated system after a trauma and you get to um you know feel that and and be with that that they're much less um apt to um, then have those um post-traumatic consequences because you're you've come back into co-regulation with with somebody following a trauma Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. and this um you know i i've done a lot of reading and research and, and work with uh trauma over the years and and uh you know, you can probably relate. You hear some be, somebody say something in a certain way, and like seven or eight different lights are all firing off that are like, "Yep, same thing was said in a different way over here." So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing that come up for um, for uh, Gabor Mate again, his work, and, and being like, "Oh, you are you're disconnected from the present when you're in trauma." And and uh, Bessel van der Kolk talking about uh, trauma as a memory disorder, and that it's like the past is always with you and it blocks you from being present to the present and blocks you from being with other people because it's sort of like the automatic the, the autonomic response to the past is blocking an effective neuroception of safety in the environment now and thus blocking connection social engagement with other people which would which would bring safety right because neuroception you know again is, is is shaped through our experience and, and you know what we have to do now is is feel neuroception and discern is it appropriate for this moment in time or is it something that has reached out from the past to to activate again so if i have a very intense response to something in this moment that feels overly intense to the situation my guess it's it's um something from my past that's reached into the present to to grab me so it's neuroception from the past something mm-hmm. felt familiar and that neuroception came up again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reminds and me what of you saying, said about, go ahead. please go ahead. No, I was just going to say what, what you were saying about, you know, all these light bulbs going off. I, you know, I, you know, that expression, all, all roads lead to Rome. You know, I, I think we are all in, in this work, um, working with the same, with the same sort of systems and beliefs and have our own sort of way of saying it. And I love it when everybody is, you know, you could say, Ooh, yes, just said in a different way. That's, that's lovely. Cause we're all kind of working to, to, to help um, people, to help ourselves, to help society be able to, to, to work better, to be more loving and caring and connected. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At least, um, at least that's how we would like to think things are going on the underside, the, the intentional people. What I was trying to, what I was going to say of the, in reference to being able to assess, you know, oh, is this, is this really right now? Or is this really something from somewhere else showing up right now? Um, and I heard a phrase from Neil Strauss, actually, the author, and um, it was where there's reactivity, there's a wound, uh, which I thought was a pretty good sort of like, just like hang that yeah. one up, you know, because it's really easy to just <laughs> yeah. pull it down. Oh, that one, right. And um, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about people with trauma being in an environment where there's another person, like you said, fully in ventral. And that being in, with that other person is going to help, you know, help them, um, help them calm down, help them resolve the trauma a little bit better. A calm down is sort of a loaded way of describing things, you know, calm down. Yeah, uh, but yeah, right. That, it's that, going to help their nervous system regulate. Yes, great. Thank you. And that uh, that goes into the the third what, where what were the terms here the the third organizing principles of polyvagal theory which is co-regulation and i want to make a little i want to make a, like i want to hang a post-it note right right in front of me here that says mdma assisted uh psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder for when we get into 
co-regulation. Um, but first, I think that we should just take a second because it's occurring to me that we both know what each other's talking about right now. But for a lot of listeners, they might be going, wait a minute. So there's the sympathetic nervous system and then there's these different ventral things. Like, what about the parasympathetic nervous system? So maybe you can explain what what these different pathways are and maybe sort of couch that in the description of what's commonly held now, the, the commonly held belief, which is paired antagonism. Okay. Yes. So, so let's do that. So um, what, what has been taught for um, generations and is actually still taught in most medical schools today is this system of a balanced system between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So that they're like on a scale and when one goes up, the other goes down. So that paired antagonism, um, what Steve's brilliant work with polyvagal theory um, uncovered is that instead of that paired antagonism of one system against another, there really are these three systems that work in that hierarchical order. So if we just unpack that a bit, we still have parasympathetic and sympathetic. Those two systems make up the autonomic nervous system. But in the parasympathetic we have two branches. We have the ventral vagal and the dorsal vagal branch. So if we had a flip chart in front of us, we'd, we'd have this autonomic nervous system here. And then underneath that umbrella is sympathetic and parasympathetic. And then under parasympathetic, we have dorsal and ventral. Okay. So, and dorsal and ventral are part of the same cranial nerve, the vagus. The vagus um is uh, vagus is latin for wanderer so it's a it's a well-named nerve because it, it starts in your brain stem and it wanders throughout your body um, going to a lot of um, different places and a lot of different functions um, the ventral vagus which again is that newest part um, really is from about your diaphragm on upward and it, it controls this social engagement heart rate breath um, all of this around the face and then the dorsal vagus diaphragm downward digestion is what takes us out of connection so we have these two extremes of adaptive survival response into connection for safety out of connection for safety both coming from this one nerve that makes up the parasympathetic nervous system does mm. that help yeah yeah it definitely does i think that uh, makes it makes it clear that you know dorsal Dorsal and vagal vagus are both part of the parasympathetic nervous system, and the confusion uh, for people who are listening would be a confusion based on paired antagonism being an inaccurate description of the functioning of the two sides of the autonomic nervous system. Right, right, because now we have a hierarchy, which is brilliant, because now we can really, you know, um, use that predictable hierarchy to to understand our own system, and also to look out at another system and, and see what another system's doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get into the third organizing principle then, um, which is co-regulation. Why don't you explain to us what co-regulation is and why polyvagal theory considers it a biological necessity? So co-regulation is, you know, my nervous system and yours doing this dance together, right? And so we could co-regulate, we could actually co-dysregulate as well, but, um, you know, and we see that a lot in, in, um, in other people, in, in, in couples, in, in parents and kids, in, in friends, that one starts to, to get sympathetically charged and the other one either goes along for the ride or goes to dorsal um, disconnect. So, But co-regulation, my ventral vagal system has the capacity to um, send that energy out to you and have your nervous system um, notice that and then, you know, engage with my nervous system. And so that um, this dance begins to take place. So that if you're dysregulated, I can offer my ventral vagal energy to you and help your system co-regulate, come back into regulation. Um, I think, you know, we, we know through, um, you know, all sorts of um, experiments, we know through, you know, the, the, orphans in the Romanian orphanages, those children through Harlow's monkeys, through all of these things, that um, connection, that touch, you know, is a way that we need, you know, we call it a biological imperative, you know, so that this connection, this co-regulation 
is something we need in order to survive. We come into the world as humans. We don't survive without um, someone there to to be with us. And in those very early moments of life, um, a nervous system is looking for another nervous system to feel safe with and to um, have that co-regulating experience with. Um, that's you know that's our hope is that babies come into the world and are met with that beautiful ventral vagal co-regulating energy right certainly does not happen all the time but um, that's what we're looking for um, for the rest of our lives we are wired to be in connection and that never goes away right we are looking for other beings to co-regulate with until the day we die Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this would explain why um, why loneliness is considered a you know a, um, a health epidemic Absolutely, absolutely. And not only loneliness, but the per- perception of loneliness, right? Um, the research is, is pretty astounding around um, its perception of loneliness, not necessarily concrete loneliness. I might have lots of people in my life, but still perceive that my neuroception might be one of, of being a part of, of the danger of that. And I'm going to have the same response as someone who is concretely all alone in the world and has no one around. So perception is this um, um, really powerful um, activator of of, um, nervous system. And yes, loneliness has terrible um, psychological and physical um, consequences, absolutely. And just for a second, while we stop there, to think about um, social support and social connection and to really think about the difference between those, that social support are you know people in my life who show up to help me do things and we all need social support in certain ways but that's not necessarily social connection right i don't necessarily feel this um, lovely co-regulation with these people or feel a sense of of bonding and connection it it may be more of a um, yes they show up to help me do these things but i'm i'm still have a perception of being alone in the world so we want to just really be aware of that and and we're looking for ways to offer social connection to others and to um, receive that ourselves yeah so thinking about co-regulation and thinking about this priority we have as nervous systems to co-regulate with others and i i remember having this experience and admittedly i was high on the cannabis. Uh, it's, it's okay. It's legal here in Canada. I can just say that openly. Uh, but I was, you know, I was talking with my friend and we were just laughing and there was nothing of any real substance being said. Some points it was just like one or two words were being said that were absurd and, and, you know, incoherent at best. And yet we were both laughing and had this sense of like, this is like the words don't even matter. This is two nervous systems in such safe connection with each other that they're just like cascading positive regenerative, you know, hormones and neurochemicals. And we're just, we're like literally getting high off each other, not, not just the cannabis. Um, and I, I, and I think about what you said about when we're making eye contact, you know, there's cues of safety and danger that are being, you know, looked for on a neuroceptive level being found and that the eyes are, you know, the quote window to the soul, but the eyes are really a window to another person's nervous system. And that when I'm looking you in the eyes, I'm I'm reading I'm reading what's going on there. And if I'm feeling safe, that's good. But I'm also letting you in, making it a very vulnerable thing. And my question here, it's like it's pretty ambiguous. So I don't know if it's a question or if you just want to comment on what I'm saying. But I'm just thinking about the the disposition of not being able to look people in the eyes or the or the, or that face to face interaction with people and how important it is for us for us to have that and maybe you could just comment a little bit about that you know um i do want to just comment on on this face to face and and i want to be careful in in saying that um Yes, we do need it, and it can be too much um, for a nervous system um, at times. You know, we, we, we look away. 
we take a break from the face-to-face contact because our nervous system is saying, oh, this feels a little too much. I have to look away and take a break, and then I'll come back. And so that dance of look away, come back, look away, come back is equally as important. Um, We certainly, you know, have this sense that if you're not looking at me when I'm talking, you're not listening. Mm -hmm. And for some people, for all of us at some time, the nervous system says, "I, I can't listen to you and look at you. It's too intense for me right now. So I'm going, I have to make a choice, right? So I'm going to look away so that I can listen and really be here and then come back. Um, you know, I had a <laughs> had a child who um, played um, sports. She was a very good athlete, but she um, was very, very shy in some ways. And eye contact was very difficult for her. And you can imagine what a coach makes a story out of that, right? You know? You're not looking at me. You're not listening. You know, you don't care about the tea, all of those stories, which was, you know, so um, um, bruising to her. And, you know, it was simply a nervous system saying, biologically, I I can't look you in the eye and perform. It's a one or the other, you know, Mm -hmm. but when we don't understand that, um, we make expectations of another person who that when their biology just can't support them in doing what the expectation is, whether that's sitting still for kids in a classroom or looking somebody in the eyes when, when, you know, you can't listen that way. So I just want to be careful about that, that we really want to, you know, attune to each individual nervous system and, and honor the wisdom that it brings in saying, yes, I'm going to move towards you right now. And, oh, I'm going to just wait a moment and, and, and t- catch my breath so that I can move forward again. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure we talked about that. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we did in, um, in your workshop was uh, we recreated the still face experiment. Um, and, you know, one of the things that when, you know, I've done my own research in the still face and in the the importance of the early infant life as the early years is when it's actually developing its its ventral vagal uh, pathway and that the relationships, the relationship to the mother, the, you know, the mother as a role might be a male, might be a female, it doesn't matter. Um, or well, it does matter, but that's not what I'm trying to I'm just trying to You're right. I'm doing yeah. I'm doing the liberal self deconstruction thing right now. Um so so th- and that's very important and that that relationship becomes a proto relationship for the rest of life. Um and that regularly there are breaks in connections and re- and repairs in connections and that break and repair is actually like you said previously, it's important that we're not always in ventral, that there are moments where there are breaks and there are repairs. But if there are breaks without effective repairs or the nature of the relationship is one of ongoing, say, shame or aggression or unpredictability, which is a which is a cue of danger for a child who needs a predictable caregiver, that it sort of infuses into the nervous system uh, over time and then sort of sh- it shows up in how we how we regulate or co-regulate with other people or don't um, later on in life, which might lead us to see a therapist. So commenting on any of that you'd like to, um, I would also like to hear from you from a polyvagal lens. What is the role of the therapist um, with their clients? Sure. So start start with, you know, I suppose it's it's the same mother, parent, um, adult, therapist, whatever it is. Uh, our, our responsibility is to be regulated ourselves and to offer that regulation to another. So as a therapist, my job is to be a regulated and regulating resource for my client. Um, as a mom, that was my job with my kids, you know, as a friend, as a as a colleague. So we regulate our own system and then offer that regulation as a co-regulating energy to another. Um, the the still face experiment and, and the research on on you know attunement um, is is wonderful. Um, Ed Tronic's beautiful work and um, really lets us know that it's these um, ruptures that get repaired that really help 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 us grow, help us develop. Right. We don't always want to be in, in attunement. We want to have these ruptures, but we want to notice them 
and make a repair. Um, I don't think we're taught to do that well um, as as human beings. Um, so part of my work with the people I work with and in my own life is to really be attuned to the rupture and notice it and name it and really make an intentional repair around that so that it doesn't just get left and then another one happens and happens and pretty soon you have a big eruption and we don't know why. It's because all those small ruptures never got never got mentioned, never got named, never got, got repaired. So, you know, that's that's important to know and, and for parents to know that they, they don't have to do it right all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. That that's not the not the not the way parenting works. That's not the way any of relationships work. You know, we we, we make missteps, we have misattunements and then we come back into attunement. Um, you know, I have this this um, phrase I like to call it autonomic intimacy. You know, that that my nervous system and your nervous system can be in that place what you were talking about when you were with your friend and it felt like you were just deliciously in ventral vagal attunement together. You know, that's a form of autonomic intimacy. It didn't have to have words. You could just feel it and it just was was there. So I, I think we're we're looking for that with with other people. Um, role as a therapist, I think, because I'm a polyvagal theory guided therapist. So in the beginning, my role, you know, I think is to um, offer that predictable, regulated presence for my clients to help them understand how their nervous system works and to understand how their responses have been patterned and begin to repattern those those systems. Um, Trauma certainly creates rigid responses and i think what i would say uh, of of well-being is a nervous system that is flexible so as a therapist i'm helping my clients um resolve those rigid responses and come into a more flexible way of of navigating the world um so that that's the foundational piece for me and then you know we do a lot of um, therapists you know do a lot of trauma processing in all sorts of different models of therapy, but for me, the platform of polyvagal and understanding, um, you know, that, that guiding question, if I look at my client, um, what does their nervous system need in this moment mm-hmm. to have enough cues of safety so that we can engage in this work, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's really um, help, helping, helping someone feel safe long enough or consistently enough that they can start to rewire or repattern a dysregulated nervous system so that they have not only a, you know, a cognitive capacity, but a physiological capacity to appropriately show up to, um, you know, good, healthy social engagement, as well as ruptures in social engagement and, and various cues of danger with the, you know, with mostly appropriate levels most of the time and being able to do so inside of healthy co-regulated relationships. Right. 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 So, you know, that flexibility, a nervous system that's flexible is a resilient system, right? So Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking to become more resilient in that way so that our, our physiology supports those things, you know, because if I'm in a sympathetic state, um, the, the emergent properties of that are not ones of social connection. You know, I sacrifice social engagement for survival. I'm now in fight flight, and if I'm in dorsal um, disconnect, um, I'm a long way from being able to look out to you and, and see you as a as a something I someone I can connect with. So, yeah, the, each state brings its own responses, and you know, to to map that, track that, and then be able to bring some ventral vagal anchoring to the system. Right. I guess that's that's one way I think about it now is I got to have an anchor in ventral so that I can then, you know, feel um, the sympathetic and the dorsal safely in, in work in therapy. My clients and I can anchor in ventral and then we can go visit the trauma that still lives in sympathetic or dorsal. But we can do it safely because we have that that lifeline to ventral. Mm-hmm. Well, this comes back to the to the thing that I put on the table earlier or to the oh, side yeah. of the table mm-hmm. earlier, which is which is MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And and maybe this is a, a larger question about um, psychedelic assisted therapy in general, although MDMA is an intactogen uh, and not necessarily a psychedelic, but one of the things that MDMA does, it's sort of proposed around around uh, why it helps secure trauma seems to be similar to what you're talking about here is that it gives a person this anchor 
in ventral. It gives a person this sense of, I am like, I can speak from personal experience. I am 100% safe and everything is love and I'm happy. And I want to express love and happiness to everyone if everything is good. And then you have that energy, almost like a bulletproof vest to quote Ben Sessa, to go in and start looking at places where there are trauma and it enables enables this uh, capacity for self-compassion, compassion even to the aggressors in situations and sort of a to be able to put stuck memories from the past in the past by being able to process them from a place of self-love, compassion, love in general, while being guided within within therapy. Would you be open to commenting on that a little bit? You know, I don't know enough about MDMA um, assisted therapy. I'm curious about it, and I've just started doing some reading about it. The, the piece that someone was talking to you about it, and the piece that I, I loved was that um, – you know, you really, you have a, a, a guide, right? You, you're not in it by yourself. You, you have um, a co-regulator there, you know, in, in my my way of thinking about it. You have, you have a safe other who um, is going to be with you for the entire time. And, and just as I think about that, that feels like it's such a gift to me to, to have this, this other person who my system feels is safe and predictable and is just going to accompany me and, and be my guide on this. So, so that piece felt, felt, um, I mean, think about it right now. It just feels very lovely to me, very deeply, deeply, um, um, reassuring. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I will do more, more reading so I can understand more about the, the, the actual process. It yeah. is, it is pretty interesting. I mean, of course, those people who are the safe, safe anchors, uh, and then expanding out into psychedelic therapy, um, such as with psilocybin, or possibly this is not being facilitated in the lab, but ayahuasca, for example, um, they're there to provide safety if you need it. But the accessing of, you know, with MDMA, that, that loving compassion, like self-love, self-compassion, that's something that arises internally. And the guides are there to remind you that if you're like, whoa, I think I'm freaking out. It's like, no, no, you're okay. But then with psilocybin and with ayahuasca, it's something that you connect with that could be yourself, but could be beyond you. And it's not the other people in the room. It's with psilocybin, you know, the mystic, you know, occasions, mystical type experiences. There's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a cosmic level other that is holding and supporting you and loving you or referencing uh, Rachel Harris's work. She's a psychotherapist that specifically um, talks about uh, ayahuasca assisted psychotherapy, specifically supporting people on ayahuasca and, and references the, you know, quote, mother ayahuasca, the, the entity that emerges subjectively as being almost like the, um, the, like the perfect therapist or the perfect secure mother figure because they take you through all the pain and all the suffering and all this stuff all the time knowing that they're loving you unconditionally and holding you even as they're holding you and you know vomiting up you know 20 years of sexual trauma or something so interesting to see how that responds to a nervous system or how a nervous system responds to that being responds logged. To that. yeah yes yeah yeah it's fascinating we're, we're, there's so much we don't know yet you know, in, 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 in my book, I, I said that yet is my favorite word mm. um, because you just put it at the end of any sentence and it, and it feels very hopeful, right? So there's so much we don't know yet and, and that we are, um, we're going to uncover and we're going to um, be better at um, knowing how to work with, you know, in, in, in my you know, polyvagal way, work with the nervous system in the most effective um, way to help that system reorganize so that um, my client has that access to health growth and restoration and um, to all of the, the goodness in life that I think you know we, we all we're all looking for and, and are deserving of yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah let's uh let's shift gears for the last uh for the last the last leg <laughs> of this conversation sure. oh, um, yeah. safety uh, even as you said, you're talking about thinking about this other person in the room that's there guiding you, like sort of brings this sense of safety. And we talked earlier about safety and neuroception. And one of the things that's in polyvagal theory is that the perception of safety or the neuroception of safety um, is not necessarily created 
by the removal of danger. So I'm wondering if, and you also talked about the perception of loneliness being more damaging than actually being alone. Um, can you talk yeah. a little bit about the perception of safety and um, and the 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 inaccurate assumption that the removal of danger equals just fundamentally equals safety? Right. So in polyvagal theory, we we, we say that um, we have to reduce or resolve or remove whatever the, the, the cues of danger and actively bring cues of safety. It's it's a both and. So just removing or reducing the cues of danger does not necessarily make someone light up with, with a, a sense of safety. Um, so if we take, for example, um, many of our systems um, are organized around um, the cues of danger, so if we think about, um, I've been flying a lot recently, so going through airports, right? Concretely, we may be safer because of all the, the policies that are in place, but it doesn't make me feel safe, mm-hmm. right? So so they may be removing some of the cues of danger by stopping people who have you know, things in their luggage, but they're not actively bringing cues of safety. So I don't necessarily feel safer um, in the U.S. with the with the mass school shootings, we're doing many things to try and concretely make schools safer, but they're not making people feel safer because we're not attending to the, the cues of safety. We're not, we're not even asking what would those be, you know? So for, for many students, um, the, the locked doors, the armed guards are, are not cues of safety. Mm. Right. So, you know, it's that sort of experience around what, and what we're always looking for when we're assessing our own, um, progress or working with with clients is what are the cues of danger in this moment, and um, how could I reduce those? And what would be some cues of safety that we might bring in? How can I make it safe enough for your nervous system to come into the present here with me now and and connect with me so that we can co-regulate? Hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because that what you're wanting to provide as a therapist seems like a, an essential thing to be offering. Because although for sure, some of us, you know, have it to more or less degree, some of us more, some of us less, if any. Um, But socially, we don't seem to have that. Of course, here in Canada, things are slightly uh, different than in the United States, depending on the state level, because the United States is not one place, one people, um, despite what the federal government might suggest at times. Um, But it, it seems like for a lot of the world, you know, if we were to anthropomorphize countries, we got a lot of dysregulated nervous systems sort of batting around with each other. Um, and I'm curious about, of course, for maybe not for myself, maybe not for you, but part of a person's identity often leans into their their nationality. And so when your nationality is associated with the dysregulated nervous system of your federal heads of state, um, how, how and how that shows up in a nervous system that is now in a, they know it or not, an ongoing situation of assessing and perceiving cues of, of danger. Um, you know, comment on that. Like what are, what are the consequences that you see of that? So if we, we speak about, I speak about the the U S and, and, you know, in our current state of affairs, um, we are bombarded every day, all day with cues of danger. Right. Um, no matter what side of this political debate you're on, there are cues of danger all the time. And what you see is this, this, these, you know, this um, societal nervous system that is dysregulated, but dysregulates in those two survival responses. Many people become that mobilized um, fight response where there's aggression and there, there's anger. Or the flight response, where people talk about <laughs> leaving our country and coming to your country. Sure, <laughs> you know, so it's there's not that, that much better. That's, I promise uh, you. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, there's another great um, part of, of the country that is in a dorsal vagal um, collapse, despair, hopelessness, right? And neither one of those are going to 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 change what's going on in in our in our country. You know, we need ventral vagal regulated people to take action, right? That's Action is needed, but it needs to be from a ventral vagal state. I've been traveling a lot outside the country, and it's so interesting because I you know, talk to people, and we talk about politics, and they say, yes, my country is um, 
being led at the moment by someone who has a nervous system that is always dysregulated, always. It is always in a state of dysregulation. And, you know, in my better moments, I can look at him and I can say, wow, that is that is a person who's suffering from a dysregulated nervous system. Um, and then, you know, I have to say, you know, if that were my client, I would be doing something active to help them regulate. And that's not happening mm-hmm. here. There's no active regulation going on, in, you know, in the highest levels of, of my government. Well, so, the challenge yeah. there is that, you know, it's like you hold, if if the current commander in chief uh, mm-hmm. of the United States um, was your client, then that's what you would be doing. But since they are somebody with like unreasonable amounts of power, in my opinion, for a, for a man of his maturity, um, he needs to be held to a different standard, you know, and not, yeah. and not like, I mean, some compassion for sure, but when he's playing with the lives of millions of people, um, you know, like yeah. the, oh, it's, it's, everything's going to be okay. Here's my regulated nervous system. For me, it seems like a sympathetic mm-hmm. response might be a, might be a more accurate response well, for him what, as a danger. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. But what we need is if, if I discern him as a danger, then I still need to have my ventral vagal system on, online. I can bring um, a lot of sympathetic energy to it, but my ventral has to be online because with my ventral, I have um, access to my thinking brain and to options and to making decisions based from that place. If I go fully into a, a sympathetic fight flight response, I'm flooded with cortisol and adrenaline and my brain shuts down. So I'm just then acting on survival response without the thinking parts of my brain. And very um, little you could actually do ride. about it. Really? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's really um, ventral vagal is 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 the key ingredient, you know, and that ventral vagal anchor that helps us be able to rise to the challenge that that you know we're seeing in in our country that the world is seeing. When you look around the world, um, you know, I I was teaching the other a um, couple of weeks ago in in France, and you know, I said. You know, we're, we're going to change the world one nervous system at a time, right? You know, some days that is the best I can do is say I'm going to change the world one nervous system at a time and I'm going to help people regulate because if we get enough regulated nervous systems, then the world's going to be a better place, right? I definitely, yeah. I definitely agree with that um, a lot more so than saying what we need is a, a you know, a, vent, a ventral anchored um, head of state because it seems to me that somebody who quests for that much power typically is somebody who is a fairly distorted person psychologically to even quest for something like that. There are very few people that I would see as they're doing it because they believe that that is like the good heart of their mission on this planet to bring peace and peace and regulated social blah, blah, blah. You know, they're that, that instead. So, so, I, so I'm, yeah. I'm just going to say that, that, that the other day I was, I was listening to, um, um, President Obama make a speech and my nervous system had this this ah oh, response it's like oh I remember when you would speak and, and everybody felt this sense of, of you know regulation and, and safety so you know the contrast between that and, and what we have now is, is striking right? yeah I appreciate you saying that because that, that makes sense I mean politically there's definitely some criticisms of what Barack Obama did and did not do um, but uh, definitely uh more at ease <laughs> to hear him talk about change and hope uh than to hear donald mr his face talking about whatever i don't yeah, even want to say, can't his even name. say like it. voldemort no, can't say it. Uh, all right yeah, so right. okay right. so <laughs> here we are we're in this situation i'm thinking about voldemort and i'm thinking about the pretty boy that uh, currently operates my country smiling for cameras and stabbing us ec- ecologically in the back every chance it gets. Um, and my nervous system is dysregulated. I am feeling like mobilized. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling upset. I feel like I don't know what to do. I'm feeling hopeless. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm in, like, what, what do I do? What are some practical approaches for me to sort of calm myself down and maybe, you know, better my own self-regulation what would be some uh, suggestions right so you know for 
for most people, um, I, I start with, with the breath because it, it is something we do all the time. Anyway, we're breathing all the time. So breath is a way to um, shape your nervous system. Um, I think in the, in the workshop, we, we sighed, we talked about sighing. Um, sighing is, is a, um, we spontaneously sigh many times an hour. So it's something we do anyway. And we can intentionally sigh as well. And sighing has been called a resetter of, of the system. So, you know, if, if you have a nice sigh, um, a sigh of relief or a sigh of contentment, any kind of a sigh, your, your nervous system takes a moment to, to regulate just a bit. So sighing is one thing that I encourage um, everybody to do. Um, it, it's, going to, it's going to bring a little bit of, of, it's going to put the brakes on just a little bit to whatever your nervous system is doing. And it gives you a moment to, to, to reflect so sighing is one. And then, you know, you're going to find your own um, resources. You know, you need both your own self-resources, so things you do on your own, and you need some interactive resources. Those are the categories that we both, you know, we all need. We need things that we do on our own, which might be breath. Um, a lot of people do some mindfulness practices. Um, some people like to um, like to chant, like to sing, um, like to go for walks, like to run, things you do by yourself. And what you do is you kind of try them on for size and think, okay, is this helping my nervous system come back to ventral, right? And some days, yes, it will. And other days, it's not the right resource. So you want to have a, a bunch of resources that you're going to be able to choose from. And then the interactive resources, because again, we're about co-regulation. What can I do with another person when I'm feeling sympathetically charged or when I'm feeling dorsal vagal hopelessness, right? What, what are some of the things and who are the people I can do it with? I, I just was writing a little piece about ventral vagal anchors and and the, the who, what, where, when. That is easy to do. So who are the people or who is the person sometimes who can be a ventral vagal anchor for me? So you might think about that. Who's in your life where you think that person is pretty consistently a ventral vagal anchor. And then what are the things I do that bring me some ventral vagal moments? doesn't have to be sustained, but moments of ventral vagal. Um, where? Where are the places that bring me some ventral vagal energy? And then when is the time? You know, and for some people, you know, it, I was working with somebody last week and she said, Wednesday, Wednesday is my ventral vagal anchor. I said, okay. Wednesday. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we'll celebrate Wednesday, right? Okay. For some people, it's spring. It's, for me, it's five o'clock in the morning. I'm a morning person. So every morning at five, I have this moment of ventral vagal anchoring that I just savor and celebrate. So you can play around with those, the who, what, um, when and where of, of ventral vagal anchoring and, and create for yourself um, these, these small, small practices that, that are just enough that when you're feeling dysregulated, you can grab one of those. Right. So nothing too big to involve. Something simple. I I live by the ocean and, and the ocean is definitely a ventral vagal resource for me. Um, so some days it's it's going to the ocean and, and being by the ocean. Other days it's just standing in my front yard knowing, oh, it's five minutes away and connected to it in that way. There are lots of ways to, to connect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, I'm going to expect you to go create your ventral vagal anchors and hear about them. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Breathing is a big one for me. I know every time I'm like, whoa, I am, I am on a level, uh, breathing and then starting to breathe and then immediately having my brain say, it's not working. Go do something. <laughs> it's like, it's not working. And I mean, being like, shh, all I have to do is breathe uh, right now. Don't worry about that. Just breathe. Don't uh, expect results. Just breathe. And then give all it a of little a sudden, time. I'm right. like, oh, yeah. okay. Now I can actually um, think about stuff rationally. <laughs> Right. And that place where you just said, now I can think about stuff rationally, that's where we need to be to, to engage with the world from a place of, of power, strength, but um, caring and, and compassion, right? To be able to do that from that place. Oh, now I can think rationally. Now I have options. Yeah. And that's when your autonomic state is supporting that. Your nervous system state has to support that capacity. Yeah. You know, I, we talked about benevolence, that beautiful word that I love that, that, you know, is the active ongoing use of ventral vagal energy in service of healing. 
And that's what I like to keep returning to, right? It's this, it's not just a, a ventral vagal state that I'm in, it's the active use of that energy in service of healing that is going to, to help change the world. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Deb, I think that's yeah. a pretty good place to, to, to call this interview to a close. Maybe you can let the listeners know where they can find out more about your work. If you have any social media feed, uh, sort of resources, <laughs> sure, sure. websites, and uh, the title of your new book. Sure. So my book is The Polyvagal Theory and Therapy, Engaging the Rhythm of Regulation. Um, and then Steve and I co-edited a, a, a book, a collected edition called Clinical Applications of the Polyvagal Theory, which is a, a number of chapters from people around the world who are using polyvagal theory as well. Um, and I'm currently working on the sequel to the polyvagal theory, which is some form of a polyvagal workbook for people to um, use um, in everyday life to, to keep working with their autonomic nervous system. Um, you can find um, my work. You can find some recorded interviews and upcoming workshops on my website, which is rhythmofregulation.com. So that's a great place. And there's a place if you have questions, you can send me a, a, a form with a question and I'm happy to, to talk with people in that way. I love hearing from people. Great. Well, uh, the listeners will know this already, but in case they're brand new, you can head to jameswgesso.com. The show notes for this episode, all of those links will be present. Deb, thank you very much, not just for your time today, but uh, your work as well as the larger sort of umbrella of polyvagal theory theory has really offered me an excellent model for, you know, my own mental health and the health of my relationships with a deeper understanding of the physiological, neurobiological things that are that that are that are happening that are related to my psychological state. And it's been it's been an excellent sort of like excellent uh ventral anchor for me conceptually. Beautiful. So thank Beautiful. you very much. Yeah. Beautiful. It's been a delight to be here with you. <sighs> yeah there <laughs> and cut that's great that was lovely <laughs> yeah it was lovely yeah thanks yeah. it was i was yeah. like i said i was really erratic right at the beginning there but definitely calmed down near the end so i told you at the beginning that i would let you know why polyvagal theory has been such an important thing for me to learn in my life one of the most important and that is that it has helped me to feel more self-compassion and have more self-regulatory control and to understand how to better engage in relationship. What I mean by this is that understanding how my nervous system autonomically responds to the world and to relationships and the importance of relationships, social engagement in the health of my nervous system um, has helped me better understand how to separate feeling from interpretation, state from story, as well as has helped me to understand better how my physiological state contributes to my the stories in my head and that I can't control my physiological state even if I can be responsible for how I respond to it. And that sort of took away a lot of shame and blame. You know, my physio, I can't control how my body physiologically, you know, immediately responds to the world. Um, and in removing the shame and guilt around, you know, those mistaken neuroceptions, you know, using the language you just learned, has given me a greater capacity, a greater bandwidth to be responsible um, or being responsible with what follows from those immediate reactions. So that's why I think it's really important. I hope you got something out of this interview. If you did, give me a big thumbs up somewhere. Maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's Twitter, um, maybe it's Facebook, I don't know. Give me a thumbs up, they feel great. You know you know what it feels like to get a thumbs up, it feels cool. Uh, you could also donate to the podcast in some way or another by becoming my patron on Patreon or by leaving a PayPal donation or you could buy a shirt like the one I'm wearing uh, or some art. All of that is available at jameswgesso.com forward slash support. So thank you very much for doing that. And thank you for tuning in. And I hope you tune into the next one. Take care.